Hello guys, in this video we're going to do a general overview of the Hello World code from the last video. So this is going to be a general overview and we're going to introduce a lot of new stuff. So it might be a bit overwhelming, but you don't need to understand it all now because we'll be coming back to a lot of this stuff in the future. So first we're going to take a look at the Hello World code. And we're going to look at this specific part. Um, and as you can see it says text db hello world comma 10. So what is db? db stands for defined bytes. It essentially means that we are going to define some raw bytes of data to insert into our code. This is the data that we are defining. Each character is in the string of text is a single byte. So the capital H is a byte, the E is a byte, the L is a byte, and the 10 is a new line. Um, you can't type a new line character, so I used comma 10 to, because the 10 is the value of the new line character which sometimes I denote the new line character as backslash n. This is a name assigned to the address in memory that this data is located. Whenever we use text, since we've named it text, whenever we use text later in the code, when the code is compiled, the compiler will determine the actual location in memory of this data and replace all future instances of text with the memory address. So we're basically putting a label on this memory address and then we use text. When it compiles it replaces that label with the actual address. So we have the name of memory address, defined bytes, and then the defined bytes. So now we're going to look at registers. Registers are part of the processor that temporarily hold memory. In the x86-64 architecture registers hold 64 bits. This means our registers can have values between 0 and, what is this, a million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, 18 quintillion, um, then negative 9 to 9 quintillion if it's signed. So um, so that, that those are the numbers ranges that the registers can hold. Registers all hold integer values, so they're whole numbers. So this is an example of what a register would look like. This is... Here's the list of our registers. You can see we have a 64-bit register column, a 32-bit register, a 16-bit register, an 8-bit register column. So um, here I've drawn a diagram of the RAX register. As you can see, one of our 64-bit registers is called RAX. So if we look at our EAX 32-bit register, that's not actually its own register. It is half of the RAX register then the AX 16-bit register is half of the EAX register. Then uh, the AL register is half of the um, uh, the AX register. So the AL register, um, if you use the AL register, it will act as if it's an 8-bit register. However, it's actually modifying the lower 8 bits of the RAX register. So you have all these registers, um, and this is generally what they look like. So you might want to uh, look up uh, this diagram because you're going to be using these a lot so it might be difficult to remember all of them. So now we're going to look at a system call. A system call or a syscall is when a program requests a service from the kernel. System calls will differ by operating system because different operating systems use different kernels. All syscalls have an ID associated with them, which is just a number. And syscalls also take arguments, meaning a list of inputs. So um, this is a, a very important table to try to remember. So when you use a syscall, it has a number of inputs. And the inputs are based on the values stored in your registers. And this is the order. So the ID for the syscall is in your RAX register. The first argument's the RDI register, then the second argument's the RSI register, then RDX, then R10, R8, and R9. So if you want to use a syscall, you would load the ID into the RAX register, and then load your arguments into registers 1 through 6, and then you would call, use your syscall. So here's some syscalls. We have uh, sysread, syswrite, sysopen, sysclose, and as you can see my ID is 0123 all the way to 328. I don't know if that's all the syscalls, but that's all I could find online. There are 328 syscalls. Um, so, and as you can see there are arguments. So we've got like argument 1 to be the file descriptor, then argument 2 is the buffer, then argument 3 is count. What I've done when I've color coded them is if I put a uh, 
number sign, that means it's a number, meaning it's coming directly from a register. If I put made it green and put a dollar sign, that means the what you it's coming from a register, but it's not the actual value coming from the register. It's the memory address to the data that you put in the register. So we'll see that in a little while. So here's syswrite. This is what we use to write hello world to the screen. So the first argument is our file descriptor. The second argument is the buffer. And the third argument is the count. So the file descriptor is 0, 1, or 2. So 0 is your standard input, 1 is your standard output, 2 is your standard error. Um, if you just want to write text to the screen, you're going to use your standard output. That is 1. So your buffer is the memory address of the string of data that you want to write to the screen and count is your length of the length of that string how many bytes are in the string so as you can see in the bottom we got arg1 arg2 arg3 and we're going to take a look at this table again remember how I associate the registers with the arguments well I'm going to take those register values and replace them in that bottom table so as you can see the RAX register should hold the value 1 the RDI register should hold our file descriptor the RSI register should hold the value of our, the location of our string of data, and then the RDX register should hold the length of it. So suppose we want to write hello world with a new line to the screen. So we want to take a look at this again. So we are putting a 1 in the RDI register because that is the standard output. Then for the RSI register, we're going to put the just the address of our uh, string. Now we don't know our address right now. Uh, so I'm just going to put ADDR since you don't know what our address is actually going to be right now. And then the count would be 14. And the count is 14 because um, hello world exclamation mark is 13 plus the new line character. That's 14. That's the length of the string. So here's our hello world code again. And as you can see, our RAX... RDI, RSI, and RDX. These are the commands I've used to load these values into them. So move, MOV, means to move data around. So if I say move RAX, comma 1, I'm moving the value 1 into the RAX register. And then once I'm done, I use syscall. So, so I'm essentially using a syscall with these arguments. So as you can see in RSI, I moved comma text, because as I said, text is a label that uh, when you compile will get replaced with the memory address of the data you labeled. So we labeled text as, we labeled the memory address for hello world as text. And so when I load text into RSI, when it gets compiled, it will load the actual memory address of um, the hello world string into RSI. And at, so, as you can see, I put an arrow there, how text is, move RSI column text is coming from up there. Now, there's also sysexit. Um, sysexit is what you use to exit your code. It tells the uh, system that you're done running your code. So, sysexit has an, um, an ID of 60, and you then it has an error code value as the first argument. So, the error code... The error code can be anything you want, but if it's zero, that means there was no error. If it's anything else, that is your error code. Um, so usually, depending on how you make the software, you can decide what error code means what. But if you just want to exit with no error, you just load zero into the uh, first into the first argument for the error code. So um, as you can see, we um, we moved sixty into RAX. That's the uh, ID for the sysex, um, six exit, um, the ID for the six exit sysx call, as a tongue twister, then, um, I moved into RDI zero because there is no error code. And so we're going to take a quick overview. So here we define bytes hello world and labels the memory address as text. Here we do syswrite and we pass in the arguments one meaning standard output, text meaning the um, address, the memory address of the text you want to write to the screen, 14 the length of that um, text, and then 6 exit 0 meaning we're going to exit our code with 
an error code of zero. So we're also going to take a quick look at sections. Um, there are three sections in x86-64 assembly. There's the dot data section, you can see that. The dot text section, you can also see that. And the dot BSS section. Um, you can't see the dot BSS section here. You'll see it in later tutorials. Um, but right now we just have dot data and dot text. The data section is where all the data is defined before compilation. So we defined these bytes, hello world. So we put that in the data section. Um, dot BSX is where you allocate memory for future use. So you basically, it's the same as the dot data, but all the data you define is just a bunch of zeros. So you're opening up a space of memory which you could use in the future. We'll be seeing that, uh, we'll be seeing that later. Um, definitely once we get to a reading user input, we'll be using the dot BSS section. So then there's also the dot text section. That's just where your code goes. So dot data is where you define some memory you can use. Dot BSS is where you reserve memory to use, and dot text is where you actually put your code. And then there's also labels. A label is a part. A label is used to label a part of code. Upon compilation, the compiler will um, calculate the location in which the label will sit in memory. Anytime the name of the label is used afterwards, the name is replaced by the location in memory by the compiler. So if you look up where we had text defined by hello world, it's basically the same thing, except we can insert these labels at positions in our code. We'll be seeing why that's useful in the future. And there's also the start label. This is essential for every program. When your program is compiled and later executed, your operating system will first try to execute the start label, the underscore start. Um, if the linker cannot find underscore start, it'll throw an error. So you need this start label. And then there's also global. Global is used when you want the linker to be able to know the address of some label. Um, the object file generated will contain a link to every label declared global. In this case, we have to declare start as global since it is required for the code to be properly linked. So essentially, if you don't know what any of that means, just know that you're going to, in all your code, you're going to need a underscore start label, and you're always going to, at the beginning of where your code starts, and you're always going to need a global underscore start. And so don't fret, this is a lot of info to be taken into at once. As we code more stuff in the future, this will become easier to understand.